Next for uh, part three general session, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Taraga be our moderator. I'm gonna be looking at some of the current research going on that has been referenced throughout the day. Um, Dr. Taraga, MD, MPH, is Division Chief of Surgical Oncology in the Department of Surgery and Assistant Medical Director for the Clinical Trials Office at Yale Cancer Center. Dr. Taraga joined Yale Cancer Center and Smilo Cancer Hospital from the University of Chicago, where he was Vice Chair of the Section of General Surgery and Surgical Oncology director of the Surgical Gastrointestinal Cancer Program and director of Regional Therapeutics, very busy man, uh, widely considered a thought leader in the management of oligometastatic cancer. Dr. Taraga is an, is an expert in regional perfusion, including HIPAC that we've all been discussing today. His research focuses on development of novel diagnostics and therapeutics for oligometastatic cancer, and he is currently the principal investigator on several clinical trials, exploring the interface of immunotherapy and liquid biopsy and the surgical management of cancer. Dr. Traga is also interested in studying how big data systems can be used to provide the most optimal cost-effective patient care. So intriguing. Thank you, Dr. Traga. Take it away. Thanks, Deb, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful morning session, and uh, um, I think this part is the most exciting part. As Jim mentioned, you know, one of the core functions of ACPMP is um, is uh, fundraising and advocacy, and I think uh, this segment will give you all a flavor of uh, of the incredible research that is being done currently that the grants that um, you help raise uh, support. So I think our first talk is from uh, Norway, Christy Flatmark, who um, has a pre-recorded address, um, is going to talk about the Pseudovax vaccine um, driven towards the gene ass mutations for patients with pseudomyxoma peritonei. Dr. Flatmark is uh, also a surgical oncologist in the gastrointestinal surgery unit um, at the Norwegian Radium Hospital. So with that, I think we'll we'll get right to her talk. Are you hearing it, Karen? No, I can't hear anything. Um... No, I, I, I don't either. Alyssa is here. We can check the volume here on our end. Meanwhile, Dr. Traga, maybe there's a question. We've got lots of questions in the queue. You wanna take up another one while uh, Zoom and staff take a look to see if we can get this volume to play? Certainly, and I think, um, you know, if it's okay, maybe we can also get uh, Dr. Lewin into uh, the presentation podium. So if we continue to have issues, we can maybe flip the talks around a little bit. Sounds great. Right. If she's, this, if she's uh, joined, then that's great. Is it is it working now? Not not yet. Can you play Friday again? Friday evening in uh, Oslo. Um, I'd like to start by thanking ACPMP for uh, uh, generously supporting our work and uh, also for the opportunity to present our work here at this symposium. As you know, uh, Pseudomyxoma peritonei is a strange and very rare cancer which imposes several challenges to us as clinicians and as researchers. Almost all patients with pseudomyxoma start with tumors in 
the appendix, which can look a little bit like this. This is an early, not so large tumor, which has ruptured. And uh, in cases where the ruptured tumor is left in the abdomen, the tumor can grow and produce large amounts of mucin, which can look like this when you open the abdomen. And uh, this is a patient, a CT scan from a patient who has really large amounts of mucinous tumor in the abdominal cavity. So the treatment for PMP is mainly surgical. Um, and what we try to do is to remove all visible tumor tissue from the abdominal cavity. And uh, after that, we give the patient hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy in the hope that any remaining tumor cells will be killed. And this is a treatment that cures at least half of the patients. So even patients with very extensive disease may be cured by the standard treatment. However, for patients who have unresectable or recurrent PMP, we don't really have any good treatment options because this, the, this t disease doesn't really respond, for example, to most chemotherapy. So this is the challenge that faces us at, as researchers in this field. And one of the things that we've been working on is looking at mutations in PMP. And what we and others have shown is that uh, mutations in the cancer gene genus are present in most PMP tumors. And if this mutation is present, this causes a change in the protein, the genus prote protein, and this change can be shown on the cancer cell surface so that the immune system may recognize it. So we were asking the question whether this presence of this mutation can give rise to an immune activation in the patients. And consequently, whether genus could be a new therapeutic target in PMP by way of an immune intervention. So to investigate this, we collected blood samples and tumor from patients undergoing surgery for PMP. And we had synthesized a, a protein or protein pieces, small protein pieces containing the genus mutation for the experiments that we were about to do. So from the blood cells collected from patients with PMP, we isolated immune cells. And then we added the mutated peptide protein pieces. And what we saw was that this resulted in the immune cells starting to divide. And what does this mean? Well, it means that the immune cells actually had seen this peptide previously. Um, and they actually recognize the mutation. And we interpret this as the presence of a strong immune re reaction against the mutation in patients with the mutation in the tumor. So the question then is, if there is such a strong immune reaction against mutated genus, why do these patients develop PMP? And one relevant question is whether the immune cells are actually able to penetrate the mucin to enter the tumor. So to investigate this, we took the tumor tissue from the patients and we isolated the immune cells and analyze them with a method called CYTOF, where we look at the surface markers on the immune cells to see which cells are present. And we found immune cells in almost all the tumors, 
which was a good good news because it means that the immune cells are probably able to get into the tumor. But the question still remains, if these immune cells are able to enter the tumor, why aren't they doing their job to prevent the patients from developing PMP? Well, another finding that we made was that the immune cells actually, we did the same thing, analyzed the immune cells with the same method, and we saw that on the surface of the immune cells, the, we found the presence of so-called immune checkpoint molecules. And these molecules act as breaks to prevent the immune cells from killing the tumor cells. We published this in uh, 2021, and this research provides uh, the background for what we hope can be a possible solution to uh, develop a new treatment for PMP, namely a cancer vaccine. So what we propose to do is to do more or less the same as we did in the experiment that I just showed. We want to give the vaccine containing these mutated peptides to patients. And what we hope will happen then is that there will be more of these trained immune cells that are able to recognize mutated genes when shown on the surface of the tumor cells. And then we still think that these immune cells are likely to have this uh, inhibition, these breaks on the surface, which will prevent them from killing the cancer cells. So we need to remove these breaks by giving an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, so this is uh, the dual treatment that we propose for this trial. So this will be done uh, in the, what we have called the Sudovax trial, where we will start by giving a vaccine for four weeks. This will be continued for a full year. And after, no, sorry, 12 weeks. And after 12 weeks, we will start giving uh, the immunotherapy also for the full year. Hoping this will control and kill the cancer cells. This will be a so-called first-in-man trial, which means that nobody has ever received exactly this combination treatment before. And because of this, the main question we're asking is whether the treatment is safe and, of course, whether we actually see immune activation. We will use the same methods that we used in these experiments that I showed you to see if we actually are able to activate the immune system in the patients. So this is a complex trial. It will be a small trial and it will be executed in Norway. Uh, on, and we will include patients with recurrent or unresectable PMP. So where are we at the moment? Well, we have received important funding support in the form of major grants from the Norwegian Cancer Society and the Southeast Norway Health Authority. And these are uh, our main funding sources. But we have also received important contributions from charitable organizations in Norway and the UK and from patients associations in Norway, the UK and the US, which we are extremely grateful for and which are uh, absolutely necessary for uh, this trial to happen. Uh, we have reached a very important milestone, uh, which means that we have ordered the GMP batch of the vaccine. Uh, this was done this summer. And this is the actual product that we are going to administer to the patients. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we are now working on the practicalities uh, here in uh, Oslo. Um, and hopefully we, everything will be ready um, to receive the uh, treatment and prepare it for administration uh, early 2024. But we still have an important challenge which is to acquire the immune checkpoint inhibitor. We hope that a drug company will give us the immune checkpoint inhibitor for this small trial, but we're not there yet. So provided that all of these um, things are solved, we hope to start the trial late in 2024. So I would like to acknowledge all our wonderful uh, co-workers and contributors and uh, of course our patients who have uh, participated in this research and also our very important funding sources without the, this funding we would never be able to complete this trial so thank you very much everyone i'm very sorry not to be able to participate in the Q and A afterwards, uh, but I assume that you will. Uh, I, I will have any questions forwarded to me by ACPMP. Thank you very much for listening. Well, that was uh, that was great, and uh, you know, obviously, if if any of you have questions about this uh, important trial, um, you know, feel free to to either put it in the Q&A or let me or Deb um, know. And so we can absolutely uh, convey that to Dr. Platmark. I think our next speaker is a rising star in uh, um, peritoneal surface oncology. Uh, Dr. Lewin, who trained at uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, now currently a faculty member at City of Hope, is uh, very interested in uh, fluorescence-guided surgery, fluorescence-guided therapies, uh, and has already made a mark uh, and is one of the recipients of the ACPMP award. And so uh, she's going to talk a little bit about photoimmunotherapy for appendix cancer. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Takaraga, for that very, very kind introduction. And thank you very much for the ACPMP for supporting our work and to all of our patients uh, who we develop these technologies and research for to make all of this possible through our combined efforts. Hopefully we can advance our treatments and the availability of options for our patients. So today I'm going to be talking to you about photoimmunotherapy of appendiceal cancer. I'll go into kind of the nitty gritty of what has been done before, what we can do better, and uh, what Is the are the slides advancing? Uh, you just you froze just for a couple of minutes. I okay. like you, you might want to back up. I think I advanced the slides a little too quickly. Okay, uh, where are we here? Okay, so there's a bit of a lag. Okay. Oh, all right. Here we go. Are we on the opening slide? Okay. So, you know, for this audience, we don't need to go into too much of details, but we know that appendix cancer is a rare cancer, but the incidence is drastically increasing as we gain more awareness of it in the United States and in Canada, and the, there is a disproportionate burden of disease in younger patients, although 20% of colorectal cancer uh, patients that are diagnosed before age 50 are, you know, young people, 30% uh, in comparison uh, are appendiceal cancers. So these patients present with nonspecific symptoms and generally are diagnosed after initial appendectomy or they present with advanced peritoneal carcinomatosis after noticing that the abdominal girth has been increasing over time, and that's not from other causes. 
And we have seen that the primary mainstay of treatment is surgery and the role of systemic therapy is dependent on the type of disease and the adjuvant therapies that we can offer our patients are limited as compared to other types of cancers. So surgery really remains a mainstay of the treatment. And looking at the established literature that we have in our patient populations with cancer, we have seen that time and again, the completeness of surgery impacts our patients' oncologic outcomes in multiple studies in the US, uh, in China, in Europe. The factors that you know, we look at multiple factors that are predictive of survival for our patients. But when we sift out a lot of this, the one of the things that comes back strikingly is that the incomplete cytal reduction has a negative effect on the outcome. And good prognostic factors are the com how complete we can get our cytal reduction to be. And then you even in patients with high-grade, high-volume peritoneal disease, now we're getting into the histology and biology of this disease, patients with high-grade, high-volume disease, when you compare them to high-grade, low-volume disease, survival is comparable as long as complete macroscopic cytal reduction is achieved. Now, we talk about the completeness of cytal reduction and how we can achieve that. But if you, when a surgeon goes into the operating room to remove the cancer, despite all advances in technology, we are still using our eyes and our hands to determine what is cancer and what is not. And cancer, if you have seen images of pictures online looks very much like our own normal tissue. And it can be very difficult to determine what is cancer and what is not. We use contextual information and many years of training to be able to visually recognize it. But this technology and the way we do it has not improved. And this is this is the bedrock of my research, because this has been a problem that has frustrated me for many years, how we can visually tell what is cancer and what is not as an oncologic surgeon. So that leads me to my research, which is fluorescence image guided surgery. It's an approach in which we use dyes that are administered to patients for us to actually better see and stain cancer in vivo, in patients, without needing to take out the tissue and stain it outside the body. That's what the pathologists do after we take the tumor specimens and we do the biopsies. They stain it outside the body, they look at it under the microscope. But what if there was a way to stain it with the tissue still in your body and we can use that signal to better see what is cancer and help the surgeons determine it and remove it to establish what is and what is not coming out. And that helps us better achieve a more complete cytologic uh, re resection. So this is an example because this there are many people who have been doing this type of work. And this work um, is in ovarian cancer, a disease uh, with a biologic physiologic manifestation in the abdomen that can be very similar to appendiceal cancer. On the left hand two panels, this is what we see in the operating room. In this field of reds, yellows, tan with nodularity. And to our trained eyes, we can pick this out and identify it as tumor. But you can see how hard it is, actually, to visualize what is cancer and what's not. And in patients who have had multiple surgeries and in patients who have had chemotherapy before or radiation before, the scarring can actually hide nests of cancer cells. And it can be an issue if we miss it at the time of surgery. Now, these patients were in a trial uh, for an agent that binds to the cancer cells and lights it up. When we turn on a special light in the operating room, we're able to see something like this in the middle panels 
which is the black and white near infrared fluorescence. And then you can color code this for us to better see it. Now you can really see that the green spots are what is cancer and we can color code what is cancer and what is not and better get an idea of the true extent of disease based on the insight you. We don't need to remove it and give it to a pathologist. Us surgeons can see it and we can see the relationship of the tumor to the anatomic structures that we are resecting. So there are a number of companies that have been working on this and um, you know this is just a sample of the few, but we are limited to what we can remove as surgeons. So these molecules can tell us where it is, but what if we get into the situation where it is anatomically impossible to remove. It's next to critical structures that just cannot be removed for improvements in quality of life. And this is where I think appendiceal cancer patients really face that conundrum. And that's why we've directed a lot of our efforts to local regional therapies, right? Regional therapies, can we can deliver a drug to specifically the abdomen. Because systemic chemotherapy, dousing our entire body through intravenous administration of uh, cytotoxic agents has not been shown to be very effective in appendiceal cancer, especially low-grade appendiceal cancer, like Dr. Shen's team has demonstrated. There is a pharmaco advantage of local therapy, too, because we know that appendiceal cancer is predominantly in the abdomen, affects the abdomen. If we can get the therapy in the abdomen, this helps. And this treats tumors most likely that are going to impact the quality of life and addresses distinctly the uniqueness of peritoneal metastases. So how does local regional therapy relate to fluorescence-guided surgery? This is where I have been working with a team that has now a new dye. Instead of a dye that just lights up tumors, what if that dye can also kill cancer cells? Because you have the molecule that is already homing to cancer cells, what if it could bring a therapeutic payload? And that gets us into the topic of photoimmunotherapy. Now we have a targeting molecule, which is what my body of research has been in, in homing a molecule to light up cancers. But now let us replace that molecule with a different dye. Instead of just lighting it up, it can light it up and kill cancer cells. Then that gets to the concept of theranostics. It is both therapeutic and diagnostic. And when we light up the cancer cells that have this molecule bind, bound to them. And the cancer cells die because there's a production of a reactive oxygen species next to their cell membrane. So that is very high specificity and high contrast. And us as surgeons, we can use that signal to visually see what is removable, remove what is removable. And what is not removable could potentially be treated by the bound molecule. And that is uniquely applicable to appendiceal cancer. So just to prove that, you know, this concept is not completely wild and crazy, this is something that has been done at the NCI in the past. There has been trials of photodynamic therapy where they used it for patients with disseminated intraperitoneal tumor. This wasn't specifically focusing on appendiceal cancer, but this was looking on at all of these cancers that have metastasized to the abdomen, a com combination of uh, GI cancers, ovarian cancers, and sarcomas that have metastasized to the abdomen. What is unique in this situation is that they gave the agent, which is a non-targeted agent to patients, and lit up the entire abdomen after surgery. So what was demonstrated in the studies was, number one, there was a response in 76% of patients. That's very promising. But when they expanded to the phase two trial with 100 patients, there was very substantial toxicity because they were lighting up the entire abdomen. There were bowel perforations and patients had bowel edema. So that can be affected. And I think with this next generation of targeted agents, we can do better because then we can decrease the off-targeted effects. So 
what I'm proposing in this project is to look at uh, the dye linked to a human carcinoembryonic antigen. I am going to quickly skip over some of the details of the molecular structure of this, but the history is that we have developed this antibody for PET imaging, and you can see targeted PET imaging using CEA as a tumor marker that is preferentially uh, expressed in appendiceal cancer can hone to the tumor. And we have used this now combined with the IR700 dye to induce rapid and selective cell killing. And there's also some suggestion that this can potentially recruit the immune system in uh, alerting the body to this antigen. So our hypothesis is that an antibody targeting CEA conjugated to the photosensitizer IR dye 700 could potentially label CEA expressing appendiceal tumor for surgeons to use it for image guided surgery and also induce a phototoxic tumor cell lysis. And then we're also going to study the in initiation of a cell-mediated immune response and potential induction of long-lasting anti-tumor uh, immunity. So um, are we out of time? Yeah, if, uh, if we could just wrap up, uh, that would be wonderful. Great. Sounds good. So... In the interest of time, I am going to skip over um, these uh, other detailed slides, but what we potentially would love to do with this molecule and this agent is that in the preoperative -oper setting, we would be able to administer patients the agent several days before the surgery, allow it to bind to the tumor. In the operating room, the surgeon would use the signal to see where the tumor is and cut out what is physically possible. And then the areas that are physically not possible would then be irradiated selectively, not the entire abdomen, but only selectively radiate to activate that molecule and kill the cancer cells. And then in future work, we would potentially study the, the downstream immune effects of this therapy. And we have cylindrical diffusers, front, um, frontal diffusers and you know laser beams that we can hold by hand. So all of these technologies are available. We are just piecing all of this together. And this is all in the interest of you know augmenting the armamentarium available therapies that we have for appendiceal cancer. So thank you so much uh, for supporting our work in appendiceal cancer research. Wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, for the delightful talk. I think um, you know you can all see why uh, why I think Dr. Lin is uh, is uh, a superstar in this space. I think one of the other studies that um, is actually recently reported uh, at ASCO this year is from uh, Dr. Bartlett's group. Uh, I think in the multi center trial with Dr. Levine using another fluorescence agent called pegcitocyanine. Um, which actually gets activated during surgery because of the acidic environment of cancers. And so um, it is exciting right now for, for fluorescent guided surgery. And I think the more exciting part will be fluorescence guided therapy. So, so thank you for that. You. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Mike Foote, uh, another superstar and uh, a medical oncology superstar. I think you guys already heard from Dr. Shen uh, earlier today. Dr. Foote is at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has a specific focus in appendix cancers and is uh, both researching as well as uh, thinking about novel therapeutics in this space. Um, Mike, thank you so much for joining today. Um, you know, we I did want to ask you for a favor. So when you're done with your talk, uh, we did have a few questions in the chat. So if you would be generous enough, uh, we'd love your, your take on some of these questions as well. But thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Dr. Taraga. No, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um... You know, I, I think one of the themes of this conference and, and this organization in general is that it really takes a village, you know, to to treat this rare cancer. And um, I'm just so grateful to everyone I've met, you know, uh, through this program and, and internationally uh, to welcome me as, as kind of a newcomer in this space. You know, I've only been in, involved in appendix cancer for the last year or two. So I'm very excited to uh, be a part of your community and uh, share some of our results with you. 
and looking forward to more collaboration. So just as Dr. Draga mentioned, I'm here in New York City. I actually am looking out in Manhattan right now, and I do have a focus in appendix cancer. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our project, which uh, this organization has very generously funded to try and define and disrupt appendix cancer. So just a quick overview, we're gonna talk a little bit of background about appendix cancer and specifically the genetics of these tumors. And you may have heard a lot about this already. So some of this may be uh, repeats from other great presentations. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about my specific uh, grant, which was funded and uh, give you some preliminary looks at it as well as the rationale for it. And we'll try and go slow as well. So if people have questions, I'll of course take a peek in the chat. All right, let's do our first bullet first. So this might be quite basic for our group, but uh, I hope you'll indulge me. So appendix cancer is, a, is, is an entity that we label as appendix cancer, but the truth is it's a very heterogeneous uh, disease. There's lots of different types of appendix cancer. Under the microscope, we know people can have different features such as mucinous features, goblet cell features, signet ring features, intestinal features. And so even though it's one disease, it has a lot of different populations that make, it up, make up it. So the behavior can be they're pretty difficult to predict. And so the, going into this study, we really wanted to try and find a way other than just looking under the microscope that we can anticipate how someone's appendix cancer will behave. In addition, as Dr. Shen may have mentioned, others may have mentioned, we don't technically have national guidelines for appendix cancer. Most of how we treat appendix cancer is borrowed from colon cancer. And many of us in this group believe that appendix has some unique properties to it, and maybe this isn't totally appropriate. Finally, uh, Genetic mutations have been studied for a while in the appendix, but it's such a rare cancer, it's hard to know how much and how meaningful genetic changes really are because most of the studies were done in relatively small groups of people. So to try and address some of these outstanding questions, we try to define uh, subtypes of appendix cancer based on their genetics, and then see whether these different subtypes exhibited different types of behavior. So it's a little bit of a busy slide, but we had this big data set of people, over 273 different patients, and we had three different types of appendix cancer. We had mucinous appendix cancer, or MAAP. We had goblet cell cancer, and then we had uh, what we called colonic or intestinal type cancer. And as you can see from this table, this is just comparing the different characteristics of our population. And you find that most of the patients had um, moderately or poorly differentiated disease and were stage four, over 88% of them. And then most of the patients as well, sorry, got cut off a little at the bottom, had at least one surgery. And this is all published too. If you wanna to take a peek at this table, just let me know. I'm gonna keep moving though. When we sequenced all these tumors, these 273 patients, we found that there were three main genes where, we, where there was a mutation, KRAS, TP53, and GNAS. And this had been seen in other studies as well. We wanted to see how these different genes interacted with one another. So what we did is we looked at the association between the different mutations. And what we found was TP53 mutations were virtually mutually exclusive with GNAS, and GNAS and KRAS mutations were buddies. They almost always occurred together. So based on these patterns over in this right-sided figure, we defined a few different subtypes based on the mutation of the tumor. The first subtype was RAS mutant predominant, which meant that the tumor only had a RAS mutation. The second subtype was really led by GNAS mutations and whether or not they had a RAS mutation. And then the third subtype was defined by these TP53 mutations. And then we had a kind of a catch-all bucket for um, tumors that didn't have a mutation in any of these three genes. And as you can see, this is well moderately and poorly differentiated tumors. There was sort of a mix for each subtype. So it wasn't that one subtype was defined exclusively by, let's say, poorly differentiated tumors. Um, there was a mix of histologies within each bucket. So one of the pretty impressive things that we found is that the mutations of these tumors told us how well the patients would do in the future. So for tumors that only had RAS mutations, there was actually no patient that died from their cancer in our study over this very long period of time. The only patient that died actually died from COVID-19 during the pandemic. The rest of the tumors, the GNAS mutant tumors, uh, there were patients who unfortunately did pass away from their disease, but they didn't do quite as poorly as patients that had a TP53 mutation. So we sensed that the TP53 mutations really suggested these patients had aggressive disease, which is something we see in other types of cancer as well. TP53 is typically a tough mutation in your tumor. And just to not 
uh, go too much into this, but we did a multivariable analysis where we really saw that the genetic subtypes added information to uh, how well patients did. And this wasn't just explained by their differentiation status or how ugly the tumor looked under the microscope or the type of chemotherapy that people got. So, sorry, I'm just advancing here. Um, whoops, went backwards. Okay, so one of the interesting things that we mentioned is these RAS mutant predominant tumors really didn't have anybody that passed away from their cancer. And there were some people that were lost to follow up that didn't get evaluated, but for many of the patients, they were evaluated for a long time. So what's the tumor biology that might be underlying why these patients did so well? So this is, uh, again, a little bit of a busy slide, but just to show you that we found that these three signals, RAS, GNAS, and TP53, were like little flags that gave us an impression of how complex the genetics of the tumor was. The RAS mutant predominant tumors were not very complicated. They were pretty straightforward. They didn't have as many mutations, and they also didn't have lots of copies of different chromosomes inside their, DNA, inside their nucleus. Whereas the GNAS mutant predominant tumors tended to have more mutations, and the TP53 predominant mutations had uh, a good number of mutations as well as changes in their chromosomes. And you can see that over here in this figure. You can see how many different bizarre ups and downs throughout the genome we saw with these cancers. When we looked under the microscope, the RAS mutant predominant tumors very rarely penetrated into the organs in which they lay on. They like to plop right on top of an organ and just kind of hang out. Whereas the TP53 mutation tumors shown here in the bottom picture were kind of ugly. They penetrated with tentacles deep inside the, the, the tissues like the liver or the omentum or the stroma of these different tissues and they look very ugly and bizarre. You can see a very clear difference between these two different types of tumors. Sorry, some of the letter got cut out by the slide. When we look at the types of treatment that people got, we wanted to ask ourselves, do people do differently when you got, get certain types of treatment? What we found is the patients that had these GNAS mutations tend to have more disease inside their abdomen to begin with when a surgeon went in to try and take out all of their tumors. And in fact, when we gave these patients chemotherapy, the patients that had the GNAS tumors tended to have less shrinkage of the tumor with chemo. You can see this dark green bar was only seen in about five or 7%. 90 plus percent of people either had the tumors stay the same size or actually the tumors grew on treatment, which is a little surprising compared to the other types of cancer. When we integrate all this information together, we see a interesting, somewhat beautiful map of the overall tumor behavior. We see with each additional change in the genetics, you get lower survival of the patients. And then when you plot it on this axis of something called aneuploidy, which means the sum total of uh, additions or subtractions from the genome, basically how dysregulated the genome is, you find that each additional change is plotted along on this molecular map of changes in the tumor. And in fact, is also associated with the burden of disease in the belly, as well as how well people do with chemotherapy. So I, I just wanted to highlight, we were thrilled to publish this paper. And in the spirit of, of, of collaboration, we made all of the data publicly available. All of the patients you just saw, their information is available online, of course, de-identified. So please feel free to use this data set for your research. Um, we want people to use it. It's right there on CBioPortal. You can download all the data. And this was a study that was done with, with my mentors and collaborators, Dr. Luis Diaz and Dr. Andreas Sursik. And it's, it's publicly available. All this information is in, is, is in a journal, the Journal of Clinical Oncology. So let's talk a little bit about my uh, next idea, our next idea, which is another collaboration between many people including surgeons and medical oncologists. So we've heard, learned a lot about the peritoneal cavity today. It's the main place that appendix cancer likes to travel. And just as our surgeons and doctors have told you, um, cytoreductive surgery can be a very powerful tool in some patients to remove their cancer and lead to long remissions. Intraperitoneal chemo is a very exciting idea that is trying to be improved upon. It's still kind of controversial, to be honest with you. Not all centers believe very strongly in it. We do it in some patients, but not all of them. And there are many reasons for that, and we can talk. That's another hour presentation. So we ran a big study called the ICARIS trial. The ICARIS trial stands for intraperitoneal chemo after cytoreductive surgery. It was a randomly uh, controlled trial. So people basically were randomized into two different arms. 
One of the arms was getting uh, cytoreductive surgery with HIPEC with mitomycin, and the other arm was getting a cytoreductive surgery with EPIC with a drug called FUDR. And EPIC was basically three sequential treatments of this uh, drug inside the peritoneal cavity. Um, the population that we saw, this was a trial that recruited colorectal cancer patients. And then separately, we also had a group of appendix cancer patients. And this was a lot of people. This was over 200 people in this trial. That's a big trial for appendix cancer. Um, all of the patients had disease just in their peritoneum, and all of them received the best, uh, to our degree of satisfaction, the best surgery they could get with a CCR0 score. And what we looked at is disease-free survival of these patients based on which type of intraperitoneal treatment they got. And we uh, stratified based on whether they got chemo before. And the really impressive thing is this trial took 10 years. That's a long time if you're a trialist to keep a clinical trial going. So this trial started in 2013. And that's because these are rare cancers. So this is something that takes a long time. And we met many people along the way. So the data I'm not going to present to you today, that'll be presented in a different uh, conference. But it was one of the first randomized studies of patients with appendiceal cancer. And we finished enrollment where I'm looking at the data now. There's some interesting things in there, and it obviously has a direct implication for treating people. But the part I want to highlight is that through this 10-year journey, we have a lot of samples from patients that they gave of their free will, both tumors from these surgeries, as well as lots of plasma. So we followed people for, again, 10 years with circulating tumor DNA, and this is all the different time points that we took blood from. We also took fluid from their peritoneal cavity, and we froze it, and we're uh, doing genomic analysis on that as well. So we have lots of samples in this bio repository that came out of this trial. Some of the problems that have been touched on today in appendix cancer in general. One, it's tough to figure out what kind of people will do well with surgery and whether you can take out all their disease or if the disease is so extensive that a surgery may not help. For many patients, it's a decision the surgeon sometimes has to make in the operating room or do a laparoscopy, which is another procedure. Second, many patients that are reaching the end of their treatment journey where the treatments aren't working as well as they hoped aren't able to go on clinical trials because they don't have a lot of tumors that are large enough to measure on scans because perineal disease can be very small. And so these patients, unfortunately, are not able to go on trials because trials need to have a target they can measure over time. So it's a big problem with appendix cancer. It's something we're hoping to fix. The scans that we do have aren't always so great. Many people in this room know that CAT scans and PET scans don't always pick up disease in the peritoneum. In fact, even circulating tumor DNA measured by previous tests and different people are doing research on this tend to be pretty low in people that only have disease in their peritoneum. I mentioned when I began the talk, appendix cancer is a very diverse disease. So there's lots of different types of cancer that can even be in a single patient. You can have certain populations of cells that are more responsive to chemotherapy, while other populations in that same person might be becoming more resistant. So sometimes you can see certain areas shrinking and certain areas growing. And we don't really understand why this is, specifically the biology of the disease. So I think this study will help address a lot of these questions. So this is the name of the study, it's a long name. But the first aim that we want to do for our study is to try and figure out if we can predict how people do with treatment and also anticipate resistance of a population of their disease based on all these samples that we collected over time. We hypothesized that this will work. We thought that DNA in the blood and both in the blood and in the peritoneal fluid actually gives important valuable information that can tell us how well patients are doing on their treatments. We also hope to learn more about the biology of their cancer to predict how different populations of their cancer go, uh, grow over time. And the way that we're doing this is with a collaboration. So I used to be at Johns Hopkins and, and I have I worked in Dr. Burt Wolfstein's lab. And so we have a great partnership with them as well as Dr. Yushuan Wang, who you see on the, scale, on the slide. And they have a very new test, which is called from Haystack, that is very exciting, that can do whole exome sequencing of the tumor and then look for these mutations in the blood. It's extremely sensitive. It's probably the most sensitive test possible. Um, so we're going to look in ways that have never been seen before on these uh, mutations. And then I'm going to do some computer work to try and parse out how different populations of a person's cancer responds to treatment over time, and which clones of these cancer, which populations are more resistant, and which clones are more wimpy and shrink faster. The second goal, and I'm almost done, I know I don't want to go too over time, is to try and see whether this information can help us predict surgical resectability as well as how pe well people do when they get intraperitoneal chemo. 
So to do this, we hypothesize that again, it will work <laughs> to anticipate uh, how much disease someone has in their abdomen, as well as how easy it is to take out. And then finally, how well people do with chemotherapy. And so the first way, sorry, I think the slide format's a little wonky, um, but is to look at our samples that we did from Icarus. This is just a different representation of it. And then the next one is, a, this is a picture I shamelessly stole from Natera, so accredited them, but it's to make different maps like this, where we can track a patient's disease over time by the types of mutations and the amount of DNA that we see in both their abdomen as well as in their bloodstream. And just to give you a little glimpse of what we're looking at here, so this is some DNA that we extracted. These are all the patients from the study, and you can see they have a good amount of DNA both in the plasma. Um, 208 patients, that's a lot of patients. And so we have a lot of patients on this study. 101 got EPIC, 107 got HIPEC. You can see the number of patients that we're, we were able to take peritoneal samples from as well as blood. Um, a good number of folks have at least two blood samples, if not more, and that number is growing even as we speak because these patients are still being seen by us. And we think we have a, a really nice amount of DNA in the blood to examine to accomplish our goals. Um, that's my presentation. I just wanted to, again, thank you. It's meant so much to me, um, all of your support and uh, this wonderful, warm community of people fighting a rare cancer. And I think we have to be creative and smart um, with this disease because we don't have hundreds and tens of thousands of patients with this. We really have to read into um, data very intelligently. And just like the other presentations have shown, think outside the box. So it takes a village. This is my lab uh, at a silly picnic. Um, and then I want to thank Dr. Diaz and Dr. Sursik, as well as Dr. Garrett Nash, who's a surgeon here at MSK, who helped lead the, uh, lead the Icarus trial with us. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Foote. You know, it's, it's always um, maybe heartwarming to see uh, young scientists, clinician scientists like yourself, um, you know, dedicating yourself to think about appendix cancer. And I think, you know, you made a very cogent point that you know, in a disease like this, you know, collaboration and kind of really working thoughtfully um, about questions will make a big difference. So I think that was that was very nicely stated. You know, there's a bunch of questions, but uh, I think we're right about at time. Um, so, uh, Deb, do we have time for a question or two, or did you want to uh, make the announcement? Well, well, you're going to make me be the bad guy. So we've got a hard stop at 3.30. Let's do a quick two minutes. Go. Okay. You got one that could do two minutes. Would take two minutes, Doctor Traga. Yeah. Let me let me see if uh, if Doctor Foot can maybe speak about this. And and so Mike, I guess um, you know the questions. And so there's a bunch of questions uh, talking about sort of off uh, label therapies for appendix cancer. And so maybe a quick yes and no if if you're okay with that. Um, have you seen a favorable response with any taxanes? in metastatic appendix cancer? We're yeah. talking just about AIDS. It's pretty neat, right? Um, I have not treated a lot of people with taxanes, but I've talked with colleagues at other institutions that have seen positive responses. And I think it's a very interesting modality. We know that taxanes work well for gastric cancer and esophageal cancer. And um, some of those cancers behave similarly to appendix cancer and spread to the lining of the abdomen. So I think it's a very interesting idea. Great. What about regorafenib? What do you think of that? You know, I actually have one patient who got regorafenib and did really, really well. Um, we don't typically see with regorafenib a lot of tumor shrinkage. It's a little bit more of a stabilizing drug in our field, mainly evidence we've learned from colon cancer. But there was one patient who actually had a lot of shrinkage with regorafenib, and we're trying to figure out why. Um, most of my patients that get regorafenib end up having their disease controlled, but not shrink a lot. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's fantastic. And what about lenvatinib? You know, they're all kind of cousins of each other. This is a type of drug called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and they inhibit different receptors. You might have heard of bevacizumab. That's another uh, family. I have not treated a lot of patients with appendix cancer with lenvatinib. Um, so I, I don't know if it's the, be I'm the best response. It's of a similar vein as Rego, so it could have some impact, but I think it will be modest, just to be honest with you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think Deb told me <laughs> this is the maximum number of questions we've ever answered in a symposium. I think we just have maybe one or two left. Um, so thank you to my co-moderators, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, Dr. Lambert, and then Deb and Jim for putting together such a wonderful program. Mike, thank you again for joining. No, that's great. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for uh, everybody that's been 
attending. Really appreciate all the speakers, all the moderators, my colleagues who have been tremendous uh, collaborating to put all this together. Again, enjoy. I hope it's all informative. And thanks again, everybody.